uh, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, crowd seeding. And the name of the presentation is crowd seeding. And I want to explain why that is, actually. And uh, crowd seeding really deals with the, the concept and certainly borrows from the concept of what I'll call cr uh, cloud seeding. And this is the, the form of um, uh, rain making, where we're putting elements up into the atmosphere in an effort to get a predictable change in, in precipitation, getting it to rain. Well, if we <clears throat> interchange cloud with crowd, and we position ourselves as the small to medium businesses at the base of those clouds in an effort to receive that rain, then fundamentally what we have there is a better understanding for the term crowd seeding. So in effect, it is a form of internet marketing that is the continuous effort to increase the quantity and the quality of the website traffic which is coming from our crowds. And, and we're going to talk specifically about that as we get into the presentation. And my talk is really going to deal with two primary areas. The first is going to be a discussion, a fairly brief discussion, of three prevailing myths uh, regarding the lies that we hear about success online. And I'm going to dispel those myths, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's really going to take, which is comprised of what we call the five steps towards sustainable profitability on the web. And without any further ado, let's get right into that. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to talk about myth number one, which seems to be the most prevalent, and that is you can get rich quick on the Internet. And I want to tell you right up front, there is no such luck. Uh, get rich quick is nothing but a, but a scam, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But essentially, there's nothing quick or easy about Internet marketing. I think there's a basic misconception about marketing on the web that says because it's online, because it's so interactive, somehow that's going to make it more easy or more uh, efficient for us to do that. And there certainly are some efficiencies to be gained, but it's going to take work. And after 10 years of supporting uh, small to medium-sized businesses on the web, hundreds and hundreds of them, believe me, we have seen the horror stories. We've heard the horror stories, and there are many, many more failures than successes online, and it's unfortunate but true. Um, and Speaking about get rich quick, uh, get rich quick is really just a scheme or it's a scam and it's an effort to get a high rate of return for a very small investment of time and money. And to quote Earl Nightingale, the founder of Nightingale Conant, uh, essentially you're going to get back what you put out. And furthermore, get rich quick is not a long term strategy. We're looking at sustainable profitability which connotes long term. So just face this fact, and that is that there is no get rich quick. Frankly, if you want to get rich quick, and I love this quote, count your blessings. All right, well moving on to myth number two. If you build it, they will come. And I have a feeling I know what you guys are thinking that's going to come, and you're absolutely right. A static website on the internet is nothing more than a field of dreams. It's a billboard in the middle of the desert on the information superhighway. Just because you have a site doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to have traffic beating a path to your door. It's just not going to happen. You have to promote your presence on the web. You have to let people know uh, who you are, where you are, etc. And we're going to talk quite a bit about that in just a moment. Okay, myth number three. Any discussion about guaranteed search results. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about this one in particular because it leads to some potentially dangerous behavior. Um, and frankly, if you hear those words used in one sentence, you should run. Don't walk, but run away. Because the only uh, individuals or, or the people who are going to make those claims excuse me, <clears throat> are search engines, and they're not going to because that's not their business. Uh, their business is to identify the most relevant content out on the web and optimize it for best search optimization, best position. Well, recently, earlier this year, the New York Times uh, published an article on some questionable SEO tactics used by JCPenney in an article called The Dirty Little Secrets of Search. And as you can see, it was published earlier this year in February. And what they were getting at was really a practice that's known as black hat search optimization or black hat SEO. 
which is the uh, method of basically cheating your way to the top. Uh, and the question that they asked was, how had, and it wasn't even asked, it was investigated, how had JCPenney's been able to show up number one in organic search rankings compared to all of their competitors in retail for hundreds of items, from dishes to dresses to dishwashers to whatever. And it's important to understand what's driving uh, the type of behavior being questioned here. 70% of all search users click on organic links, not paid for links. So that's what's at stake. There's a, the, the majority of the traffic is going to the organic links, not the paid links. Now the answer to the question is simple. JCPenney paid to have thousands and thousands of links placed on hundreds of irrelevant sites. Now it's important to remember the term irrelevant because it's going to come up in a little bit later. All of those sites, all of those irrelevant sites led back to JCPenney's. Now it's also important to note that this is what's known as a linking scheme, also referred to as link farming. And it is specifically and directly a violation of the Google Terms of Service. Okay, well, we know what happened, uh, or, or basically this is what happened after Google found out. They made what's called a manual correction. And within two hours, JCPenney went from the top of page one to the bottom of page 10, essentially from being the best position to not even showing up on the radar. Now it's important to note as well that this was not the first time that Google had noticed this kind of behavior on the part of this particular company. Uh, they detected previous violations no less than three times. So it, it, it bears thinking about, you know, what's going on here. Well, the, uh, the question that I have in mind is really not necessarily what they did or how they did it. I fully understand um, both, of, both of the answers to those questions, but my question was really why they did it. And, and frankly, the why they did it is also straightforward. Uh, as a publicly traded company in uh, 2010, their revenues were the same as they were in 2001. And that's worse than being flat. That's actually uh, in decline because they weren't even keeping up with inflation. And obviously that's going to result in a fairly substantial amount of pressure from their investors to deliver stronger results. It's important to note that 60% of the traffic that comes to the site goes to, for, to, to Google search results, goes to the top three results. That's a big deal. So, you know, that's what was at stake here. And they also knew they were going to reap some fairly substantial res results. The article went on to say that there was an independent study, albeit sponsored by uh, the New York Times, that for just one of those terms of the hundreds that they've identified or that they had identified, just for one of them, may have attracted up to 3.8 million visits per month. Now, I'm a numbers guy. And I'm always interested in conversion because we, we here at CASBAR are concerned most with how effectively we are converting eyeballs to visitors to actual uh, customer sales. So if we take a very conservative percentage and we say, okay, one-tenth of one percent, one-tenth of one percent of those 3.8 million visitors turn into customers. That's 3,800 sales. Now if we further assume that the average purchase price was $50, that's $190,000 per month. Now if we assume additionally that there were 10 of those terms, of the hundreds and hundreds, 10 of them, that produced at a similar level, and I think that's a reasonable assumption, that's $1.9 million per month in direct online revenue. If you do the quick math, that works out to $22.8 million a year. So you can see there's real money involved here. This is big money. Well, here's what happened, basically. The result was bad publicity. People don't want to do business with cheaters and liars. I mean, this is an investigation that was put out on the web in a large, large distribution. 
Uh, the company stock took a beating. Obviously, they lost uh, retail sales because they got completely re-indexed and reshuffled. And not surprisingly, they fired their search engine consulting firm. Well, it's also interesting to note that um, there are, uh, well, a couple things. You, you want to bear in mind that, as I've kind of demonstrated here, you don't want to get involved in anything related to black hat SEO or black hat search optimization because your result as a small business is not going to be as favorable, not that theirs was, as what happened with JCPenney. JCPenney, I believe, was dealt with in a, in a fairly favorable manner. Um, it turns out that they also are one of uh, Google's largest uh, advertising customers. So you wonder whether or not Google might have uh, offered them some preferential treatment. I can assure you as a small business you would not be offered preferential treatment because if you are caught as a small business conducting black hat SEO or black hat search optimization activities you will be what is called blacklisted and they will they will de-index your URL, your website address and then it's game over. You're gonna have to find another URL or change the name, name of your company because the one that you had isn't gonna work for you anymore. Okay, well, we're going to shift gears a little bit and get on to the more positive things. And I want to do that by way of just a, a quick story. Um, over 10 years ago now, before I started the business, I had a mentor of mine who asked me this very question. He said, Charles, do you know what the secret to success is? And I said, no, Brad, what? And he said, one thing. And I said, one thing? And he said, right, one thing. And I waited expecting him to say something else, and he didn't. And I said, and that one thing would be? And he said, I have no idea. But whatever you decide, do it with all your heart and do it better than anyone else. And strangely, my colleague's uh, persona, if you will, his characteristics started to change to that of Jack Pellance in his award-winning role as Curly the Grizzled Old Cowboy in his movie with uh, Billy Crystal, City Slickers, from back in the early 90s. And what really came out of that was the fact that both of them had made a very specific and accurate point, and that is your e-strategy needs to be all about focus. It's your solution to the particular problem that singular reference, the particular problem that your prospects and customers have. And this speaks to unique value, which we're going to talk quite a bit about in just a moment. There are really three things that are going to define your success online. And it's finding your highly targeted group of customers, communicating with them, and getting them to make a purchase or purchases. And that's really, in the simplest of terms, what we're trying to accomplish with an effective e-strategy. Well, when we talk about unique value, the question that comes up is, who needs a unique value proposition? And the short answer to that is, you do. If you work for or own a small business and you want to generate more income from the web, that's an absolute. You need to view your unique value like a vein of gold because you don't have the ability to compete with your largest international competitors. You can't go head to head with them because they are going to outgun you and outspend you every single time. You don't have geographic boundaries to protect you from larger competitors. They will outgun you and outspend you and they're not going to feel bad about trying to put you out of business. That forces you to think in specialty terms as opposed to commodity terms being a half an inch wide and a mile deep in terms of how you're defining yourself, narrow and deep, because you don't have the economies of scale, and frankly, you can't compete with the big guys. You have to outflank them and outmaneuver them, and that's the way you're going to succeed based on unique value. Look at it this way. Unique value is best understood in its, its parts, if we break it down into its individual parts. Unique refers to the characteristics of your product or service that are going to set you apart from as many of your competitors as possible. Now that presumes that you know who your competitors are, but it's very, very specifically setting you apart from as many of them as possible. 
Value is basically what your customers are getting for their money. And proposition is that statement that is going to contain only logical constants and having a fixed truth or value, which is a direct lift out of the dictionary. So essentially what it is is your factual and truthful proposal to your customers. Now ask yourself two questions. What makes us different and why should anybody care? What is it about what we do that makes us different? And why should our customers care? Because if you can get to an answer to those two questions, you're going to be moving a lot further along towards the definition of your unique value. Because knowing who your customer is is the first rule of marketing. And now that we have a clear understanding for who or what our unique value is, that answer to those questions, what makes us different and why should anybody care, we then move into what we call the Customer Composite Index. This is a process that we use here at CASBA, which very specifically and succinctly defines a list of characteristics that talks about who, what, where, when, etc. It's a map, a mind map, if you will, of wants and needs that we create for our customers' customer. We create profiles of their individual customers determining that list of characteristics that very specifically defines them. Now, recently, we went to a Search Marketing Association event, and as you can imagine, Google was very well represented there, and they talked quite a bit about the fact that they've developed a new process where they're defining uh, groups of web buyers, customers, and they call that a persona. It's interesting because we've been doing that and we've called it a customer composite index or a CCI since the very beginning and Google is now actually pursuing that very thing calling it a persona. So buying groups are defining people by the group or the persona that they have based on how they actually purchase products online. I found that very interesting. Now there's really four reasons. It could be one of four or all four reasons why you're online and the first one is brand building. Uh, dominating the category. Now I subscribe to the rules of branding that were posited by Al and Laura Reese and uh, Al Reese co-wrote the 22 Immutable Laws of Branding uh, and the tw actually uh, he, he co-wrote the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing with Jack Trout and he co-wrote the 22 Immutable Laws of Branding with his daughter Laura but in the book The Fall of Advertising and the Rise of PR uh, Jack basically says there's really three rules. Number one create a new category. And, and it's subtle, but it's important because, again, as a small business, why would you want to compete in an existing category when you have the ability to distinguish yourself as a brand leader, if you will, in a new category? So create a new category, give it a name, and then dominate it. And all of these uh, category, or all of these brands here are, are, are category dominators or category killers they're all names we're very familiar with, but understand as well that all of them started in somebody's back room, the garage, the shop, the warehouse, uh, whatever. So, I mean, they all started in the same place and they grew to be category killers and certainly the web provides you with the opportunity to go out and dominate a category. Uh, the next is what we'll call sales channel or generating revenue. It's e-commerce and qualified leads, which we're going to talk about quite a bit in just a moment. Efficiencies and effectiveness, there's a lot of opportunity for small businesses to gain efficiencies by taking offline processes and bringing them online and then also customer service and support very specifically focusing on improving customer service and support through automation, chat, whatnot. But there's any one of those or all of them that you might be pursuing and it's important to get your head around why you're online because it's going to dictate the next steps in the process which are sustainable profitability. Step number one is the development of content. And the question that I have is, well, what's content? I mean, we, we, we toss that, that term around quite a bit and I don't think we really stop very often to think about what specifically content is. Well, for lack of a better definition, content is words in any form, and I mean that literally. However it manifests itself on the online, content is words, which are the most powerful communications tool 
known to mankind. And in his uh, rather eclectic, albeit uh, enlightened book, The Medium is the Massage, Marshall McLuhan, who was a media mogul of sorts back in the mid-60s, and the other thing that's interesting about Marshall McLuhan is he actually predicted the creation of the World Wide Web some 30 years before it occurred. And he was very savvy with respect to communications and media and so forth. But Marshall had the, the following to say about words, basically. Western history was shaped by the phonetic alphabet, a medium that depends solely on the eye for comprehension, which encouraged the habit of perceiving all environments in visual and spatial terms. And we have to think a little bit about what he's saying, but essentially what he's talking about is as you create content, visually you have to be concerned with, in one case, the rules of topography. As you develop content for the web, don't neglect the rules of topography, the way that you write, uh, the actual look of the content, bolded subtitles, the types of fonts you're using, the size. One of the things we have to bear in mind is the fact that a very large demogra a demographic of which we are a part, some of us, is baby boomers. And they might need to see content uh, a little bit uh, bigger, larger font styles and sizes, so forth. Um, essentially, what you're focused on when you're developing content is the delivery on the implied promise. Your web visitors are coming with an expectation and you have to deliver that real and measurable benefit to them because that's going to dictate whether or not they're going to stick around. And as a colleague of mine who's a content development expert, Yvonne DeVita, uh, says words count and the right words count double. Now there's also a fairly well-known statistic out there that says that 70 percent of internet users will not revisit a graphically rich website and the reason for that is it's not delivering on the words. People are looking for data. They want content. They want something that they can read. Okay. Well the next thing we're going to talk about is whether or not those potential customers, those prospects are going to find you. And we know that 75 percent of all activity on the web begins with somebody searching for something and that amounts to roughly two million unique searches per minute. Now those are pretty tough stakes. I mean that's a lot of competition. But to make matters worth, do not lose sight of the fact that we have eight seconds to capture somebody's attention and get them to take action or they are gone for good. That's it. You've got eight seconds. One click and eight seconds and they're gone. So we have a very, very limited amount of mind share that we have to capture to ensure that somebody's actually going to take action on our content. So bear that in mind. Okay, let's get into the four laws of good content. The first one is it's got to be relevant. But relevant to whom? We have to ask that question. Well, clearly, it's our target customers. Remember, we're talking about the customer composite index, where we've identified the profile and we've developed a unique value proposition that is targeted directly at that profile, that list of characteristics, that mind map of who they are, what they want, where they are, etc., all focused on their wants and needs because that's who we're communicating to. It's got to be relevant to them because if we miss this point, number one, they're never going to find us because the content isn't even relevant to them. Now, second, it's got to be significant. And significance is all about building trust. They're going to assess a value uh, on your content based on its significance. And they're going to determine whether or not they trust you sufficiently so that they're going to take the next step and ultimately become a customer. And, fortunate, and hopefully we're looking for that customer loyalty, the repeat. Now this is not about quantity. Stuffing a site full of irrelevant content is not going to gain any benefit with respect to significance. As a matter of fact, it's going to work against you. It's about quality. Now, Recently, Google updated their uh, search algorithm in, a, in, an, uh, in an update that they called Panda. And essentially what they were focused on was getting rid of, getting rid of content spam 
and also what's called content scraping. And, and content scraping is a process or a procedure that is used by some questionable uh, marketing people on the web, uh, primarily dealing with what's called marketing automation. And essentially all they're doing is repurposing content from one source, scraping it on a search when they find it, and then repurposing and putting it in another place on another website in exactly the same uh, fashion. Well, what happened was Google went in, they modified their algorithm, and now those sites are basically penalized, and only the original source of that content will be the one actually getting the traffic. So there's no, there's no uh, ability to actually repurpose it that way. And that speaks to the importance of developing unique content for your audience, for your purposes, because, again, we can't expect that we're going to get indexed without doing so. Okay. Law uh, number three, frequently updated. You got to stay on top of your game because if you're not updating your content, it's going to get stale very quickly. Now, one of the things that we see frequently is web counters and also web update type of notifications. And there is nothing worse than going to a website after finding some content and realizing the, the information contained there is outdated by several years. Um, I strongly recommend not using web counters or update notifications, automated update notifications, unless you can ensure that you're going to keep a regular schedule of updates. Because if you don't, again, it's going to work against you. A better strategy would be actually letting your prospects and customers know through some forms, through some uh, outreach vehicle, medium, that there's new content on your website. That's a great reason for them to come and check it out because you've got good content there. It's frequently updated. They're going to want to come there. Okay, fourth law, got to be current because nothing is worse than yesterday's news. Outdated content is completely useless. We know that news. It's got to be cutting edge. It's got to be good information. We have to answer the questions and solve the problems because that's what they're coming there for. And that's, a, that's the, the manner in which we're doing that is maintaining that currency. And I would also offer that your bounce rate, and your bounce rate is the, is the uh, speed with which people bounce out of your website. So they come in, they click, and they, and they come to a page, and they realize it's not the page they're looking for, and they're out. Um, that's a bounce rate. And I would suggest and submit that your bounce rate is directly proportional to the currency of your content. So make sure that it's maintained and keep it current. All right. Now, I have to brag a little bit. Um, <laughs> this is some content, actually, uh, from one of our independent sales reps who actually went to our website, watched all of the dozens and dozens of videos, and uh, posed this question. He said, after I watched these videos, he said, I asked myself this question. I'm a small business owner. What can Casbah do for me? And here's the list he came up with. And I, I just love this. Reduce cost, increase sales, increase revenue, update my website instantly, receive professional customer service and support, get more repeat customers, RFQs received, increase company growth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And most importantly, sleep better at night. So, Jim, if you're out there, if you're listening, I really, really appreciate this. But after reviewing our content, this is his objective representation of what a person who views our content, in this case our testimonial videos, which I'm going to talk about in just a bit, would come away with. Here are the nuggets of content. And, and you know, there's another way to look at this. We could actually use this list as a optimization strategy where we would develop content against maybe these search terms because maybe somebody, a small business person, is going to be out there searching on these particular terms. Uh, and we could optimize the videos to actually do that through the alternative text and the descriptions for those videos. But anyway, that's a little, uh, a little um, uh, opportunity for me to gloat a little bit about uh, our own content. So if you get a chance, certainly check out the uh, testimonial videos to see if you come up with the same. Okay, step number two in the sustain sustainable profitability process is community. Community is all about people coming together around a common interest on the web. That's what the web is all about. It's an interconnection of connections, or it's a connection of interconnections, however you want to say it. That was, that was uh, 
the way that it was described. But it, it said, essentially, it promotes a sense of belonging. We as humans have an absolute need to belong to communities. And as a business online, you have to be the center of influence in that community. So you have to be the reason, the common interest, why people are coming together. Because this is where they're going to validate you. They're going to de determine whether or not you are worthy based on your position in the community, which is going to set up the next step, which is communication. And communication is all about regular and frequent dialogue with your constituents. Staying in regular contact with your community members is absolutely critical. And you've got several Internet assets that are going to help you tremendously with that. Clearly, first and foremost, is going to be your website. That's your information repository where you're keeping all of that fantastic information that you're going to want to bring people back to. Uh, another one that's a great outreach uh, methodology is email marketing. Uh, Ezine or newsletter uh, is a great tool, and Ezine is just another reference to an online newsletter or an e email newsletter, if you will. Um, I wouldn't recommend to a small business that they pursue anything more than maybe a once a month newsletter because I can tell you personally that a newsletter can be a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, to actually produce because it takes a lot of concerted effort. Now, the thing that changes a little bit is social media. Social media has opened up a world of possibilities for regular communication and networking and community and so forth, where you've got your blog, which is associated with your company website, you've got your Twitter feed, Facebook, LinkedIn, among a thousand other alternatives. And I'm not exaggerating. There are literally thousands of other social media applications that are very industry or very community specific that you can participate in. And it's also interesting to note that one out of eight minutes spent online is spent at a social site. So clearly, Social media is having a dramatic effect on the landscape on the web. Okay, step number four is commerce. Commerce is really a two-part definition. The first part is really the more typical or traditional part if there is such a thing on the web. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's e-commerce. E-commerce has to do with the development of a product catalog. You've got a shopping cart, a checkout process, and transaction processing that's occurring. And that happens to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars every day all over the web. And our customers have taken great advantage of that, whether they're actually selling a product directly online or whether we're just developing uh, product pages within a catalog. Because if they, for example, are a manufacturer and they have a, excuse me, an engineered product that might not be saleable through a traditional shopping cart transaction processing methodology, the product catalog and the product page actually allows us to have another page of content that we're optimizing. And think about that. That's a product description and all of the information associated with that product, which might show up in a search result somewhere, which is very, very positive. The other part of the definition, the second part, is what I'll call lead generation, where we're really focused on increasing the number of qualified leads, reducing cycle times, improving hit rates, and generally generating more sales. Now, what I have building at the bottom of the screen there is what I refer to as the typical sales process. It's a half a dozen steps, suspect, prospect, lead, qualified lead, proposal, and close. Now, what I would say is that's a fairly typical uh, a series of steps in a sales process. I realize as well that um, we could uh, 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 dummy that down a little bit or actually increase the significance of it depending upon the complexity of the product that's being sold. There might be a bid specification process or engineering process that would have to be incorporated into the proposal cycle. But fundamentally, those are the steps in a typical sales process. And what I want to say about that is the following. When we get people finding you based on your content, Validating you as the center of influence, the go-to people in your community, and then communicating with you about a product or service that they need and they want and they know that you have, you've just reduced the cycle time in that process by two-thirds. You took them from a complete unknown suspect to a qualified lead, and it happened on their nickel and on their time. That is a huge efficiency gain. Okay, That's reduced cost. The other side of that is, 
All you have to do at this point is propose and close. Now I would offer that that is, again, an oversimplification, but there is truth in what I'm saying there. Quite literally, at that point, all you have to do is propose and ask for the order. So we've reduced our expense here by reducing those cycle times rather dramatically. The other thing that I would offer is, as a specialty provider, I want to bring you back to the fact that you're not selling commodities. You're selling a specialty product. Specialty products sell at higher margins. There are two ways to increase profitability. Reduce costs or increase revenue. And as Ben Franklin says, doing both at the same way or at the same time is the best way to do that. Guess what, folks? That's exactly what we're talking about. Reducing costs through improved efficiencies, <coughs> excuse me, and selling at higher margins. That's exactly what we're talking about. So we have there the ability to actually improve our profitability directly as a result of uh, uh, commerce on the web. Okay, fifth step, customer service. What is it? Well, it's support. We have to give our customers and prospects or suspects, prospects and customers what they want, when they want it, how they want it. We have to provide them with online manuals, documents of any type. Uh, we've got to answer the questions that we know that they have, and by doing so, we're also going to validate ourselves and their minds further because they know we have the answers to their questions even before they ask them. Another thing that we can do is testimonials and case studies, and as I mentioned, we have some excellent uh, testimonials uh, listed here on the CASBAH website, and you can see there are literally dozens of testimonials listed here. As a matter of fact, we have uh, testimonials from a manufacturer, a distributor, a dealer, a retailer, a dealer, and another manufacturer, just to give an example of those there. But these testimonials are very, very powerful expressions of what our customers are getting for their money. And they make no bones about the actual uh, results that they're achieving in, in no uncertain terms. And we're doing all of that because we have to support the buying decision. That's what we're there for. We are trying to close the deal. We have to support that buying decision with everything that we're doing in the customer service and support side of things. Okay, in summary, do not fall victim to the prevailing myths on the Internet. Get rich quick. Uh, if you build it, they will come. Again, you're out in the middle of the desert. Uh, guaranteed search results. Please pay particular attention to this because, as I said, the results could be devastating for a small business. Do, on the other hand, pay very close attention to implementing the five steps towards sustainable profitability on the web. Develop content that is relevant, significant, frequently updated, and keep it current. Become the center of influence. Be the reason why people are coming together. Be that common interest. Become the go-to people within your community. Communicating with them regularly and frequently, creating a dialogue, a flow of information with that group that is very generative, giving them all the reasons they need to communicate with you. Provide them the opportunity to either buy products directly from you through an e-commerce environment or generation of leads, quote requests, etc. And certainly last but not least, provide customer service and support by providing them with what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. Those are the five steps towards sustainable profitability on the Internet. Okay, now, in closing, I have an assignment for you. First, in the first part, I want you to define your ideal customer. Develop your own customer composite index. Create that CCI, that list of characteristics. Ask all of those questions, the who, what, where, when, how, and why. And create your own customer profile because, again, that's going to be the first step that you take 
towards targeting your content or targeting the development of, of your strategy online. And part number two is ask yourself these two questions. What makes us different and why should anybody care? Because it's in the answer to those two questions that you're going to begin to discover your unique value and that's very, very important. Identify who your customers are and target your unique value proposition directly to them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I really do appreciate your, uh, your attention and your patience. I thank you so much for attending this seminar. Uh, I do very